This is lecture number six for Math 302, and in this lecture I will discuss two elementary numerical methods for solving differential equations. So the two methods to be discussed are Euler's method, which is the most elementary and simplistic method, numerical method for solving differential equations, and then the Runge-Kutta method, which is um, a significant improvement but is an increase in complexity. Uh, basically, there's two reasons for using a numerical method uh, for solving a differential equation. First is that there's no other way to solve it. It is either too complicated or the integrals involved are too complicated, um, and you simply can't find a solution. And the second reason is the geometry. Perhaps the differential equation is some sort of, um, well, perhaps a partial differential equation, such as um, where you have um, heat flow or heat distribution, or you have Maxwell's equations. You have some equations that are applied to a particular geometry that's very difficult. For example, if you had a long strip that had pointy ends on it, well, how do things, you know, you don't have a solution for something like that that's closed form. So part of it could be the geometry of the real world situation that you're applying this um, differential equation to, and the other can just be the differential equation itself. What you end up with is not a solution. You have to have a starting point, and from that starting point you attempt to draw the solution curve that would emanate from that starting point. And as I mentioned here, you do this in discrete steps. So you get a sequence of points in the um, ty plane, because we're talking about partial derivatives with respect to time, and you hope that that sequence of points will um, look something like the curve. So if here's your y and here's your t, and maybe this is your starting point right here. And then you, from that, come up with a sequence of points. And hopefully that is following the curve. It may not, of course. Um, okay, so maybe you follow pretty much, and then there's some kind of dip here, and then the curve goes off here, but you end up over here. So this is the kind of error that you can get. Do you have any way of knowing that you've gone off track? Uh, actually, you do not. You might go back and try it with a smaller step size. You might try a different method, uh, but that's an issue. In fact, the whole issue is that this is a field of study, and you'll have many more classes in this in the future. With Euler's method, you're essentially using the first two terms of the Taylor series. All right. So that means that your function is some function at a certain point, we'll call it h naught, plus the derivative of the function, times some step size h. And that will, that will get you to the next point. All you use is the first derivative. Of course, does that really describe a curve? No. It just gets you to another point. And if you use too big of a step size, you're going to have trouble. So in order to solve this, you need to have the differential equation. So you'll take that first derivative, and whatever that is is what you use here. That function of ty is what you're going to use for the derivative. You need a starting point. Here's the y naught will be your starting point, and t naught. This will come from your initial condition. So it's time t0, the value of y, at t0 equals y0. So we use zeros on here even though it may not be starting at zero. That just means the start time. Usually you'll set t0 equal to zero and start there, um, but it's not necessarily true. You could start at any value of time and you have the y value that you associate with at that time, and then you have this function, and now you pick what's called a step size. The step size is just the difference between the steps, and these are going to be discrete. So for example, h would be time 1 minus time 0. Um, for the most elementary method, you keep the time step constant. For more advanced methods, the time step changes depending on where you are in the problem. But that, again, is more complicated um, 
that's more complicated and right now we're just going to use plain old Euler's method and see how this works. The best way is just to use an example. So I have this initial value problem dy by dt equals 3 minus t. So 3 minus t is the value of the derivative at every value of t and I'm going to start off with t naught equal to 0 and y at 0 equal to 1. So my initial point t naught y naught is 0, 1. What's, why I'm using this one is because we can have an exact solution. Here's the exact solution. All right, and we can compare the numerical results with this exact solution. Of course, if you had the exact solution, you would not do it numerically, but um, this is for demonstration purposes. So how do I fix the next step? t1 equals whatever t0 is plus h. And the next value, y1 equals y0 plus h, the step size, times dy by dt, but dy by dt in this case is 3 minus y at times t. So you use the previous one, 3 times y naught. Okay, so I've used the information previously. Um, here was the initial t0. Here's the initial y0, and I use that to construct the next values, t1, y1. And then I just go to the next step and continue this on its way. Okay, and here's the result. Here was the initial point right here. That's initial point, t0, y0 equals 0, 1. In the first case, I took a step size, well, let's go here and say I took a step size of 0 0.25. Right. That means I'm going to go up here, so I'm going to put quite a few steps in here between 2 and 0. I'm going to have 8 steps, right? Okay, so time is just going to advance to 0.25, but I'll use the slope that's coming off of here for the... Um, um, okay, so right here I have a slope for my solution and I use that to advance it. So when I advance it just a small amount I'll end up here and then um, I may or may not be on the solution curve but okay. Then I take the slope here and I advance it again. Let me get another color. If I can manage to do that. So now I'm at this point so I get another slope and I advance it again until I get here, then I go back and use another slope. So if I use a step size of 0 0.25 for this particular equation, then I have pretty good agreement with this black line. The black line here, I'm sorry, the blue line here is the exact solution. Let me get the different marker here. Okay, so the blue line here is the exact solution. You see the red line is going a little bit above it. I sort of overshot on this, but it seems to settle down and it's not too bad. Now what happens if I double the step size? That first slope here sent me all the way to here. Whoops. Oh, sorry. Sent me all the way to here. Alright, let me clear that off and we'll try it again. Okay, when I had h of 0 0.25, my first point set me quite a ways here. And it didn't take me much more until I was right here. And after that, uh, it looks like I'm kind of on a straight line. So this was 0 0.5. So it really overshot and then it seems to settle down. All right, And here was 0 0.25. Now let me decrease this to h equal 1 and h equal 1, that first slope, sends me way over. This is like I used h equal 2 on this, but I didn't, I don't think. Well, anyway, it sent me way over and then it, the slope there sent me way below, way up, and way below. If you remember correctly, this violates the whole ideas of these differential equations. So my solution was, this is was the exact solution, 3 minus 2 e to the minus t, I think, all right, now I have to check on that, sorry. Yes, I was right. y of t equals 3. 
minus 2 e to the minus t. Now recall how we analyzed these solutions. We looked and found a transient term and a steady state term. Not all solutions are going to have these, but you can point them, you can see them in an example like this. Here's the transient term right here. Here's the steady state term. How is this going to work? Well, the transient term is going to asymptotically approach the steady state term. It's going to take it about five time constants to do it. At the time constant here, t over tau, tau would be one. So it's going to take about five units of time, and it should be asymptotically close enough to three that you can't distinguish it. And you can sort of see that in this equation. Here's the five up here, and you really have uh, convergence here with that um, and to that steady state term. Now if you put the 3 into the original equation, you would end up with dy by dt equals 0. So 3 is an equilibrium value. It is a solution. So if I put 3 across this whole line, this green line, trying to draw a straight line here. This is y equals 3. This is your equilibrium solution. It is a solution and because uniqueness of the uh, principle of uniqueness, because that's satisfied here, solutions can't cross. Well this numerical solution didn't have any problem crossing several times. So these numerical solutions don't necessarily follow the theorems. All right, no, so I'm pointing out that not, not only is the solution by this numerical method, Euler's method, with this step size not a good approximation to the function, to the solution function, it also violates the, um, which should be the behavior of the differential equation. Okay, so um, we'll look now at another method. This is, again, just the most elementary of methods, but you can see how it can work and you can see how easily it can be programmed. You also can see here how easily it can um, it can be wrong. So I'm just um, trying to show you this to give you a very good a lot of caution when using Euler's method. Don't you think you can just grab it and draw a solution curve? It may not happen at all. Also, the step size. You might start off and have a step size that's a certain size, so maybe h equal 1 was good for the problem for part of the way of the problem and then suddenly became bad. So just because you have a step size that works for part of the solution curve doesn't mean it's going to work for all time. So the next method that I'm going to talk about is the runga kuda method that occurs, um, is discussed a little later in the textbook, I think in the last chapter or so, but it follows right directly from Euler's method. If you want to start improving on Euler's method, you start doing things that are shown here in the runga kuda method. Now there's several orders of runga kuda. We're going to use the fourth order, which is one of the more popular ones. And the idea is to use not just the slope at the point, but a whole bunch of slopes at nearby points. The trick is to find those nearby points. So the first thing I do is I start at my, here's my initial point, here is the f, from the, remember the first derivative equaled that function f, we're talking about that function, the derivative, at t and y, so I evaluate that derivative at the initial point and I get k1. This is the slope that's used in Euler's. Okay, so here's my first one. Now, I take that slope, okay, here's t0, I want to go, my next point is going to be at distance h away at t1. t1 is still t0 plus h. And I've started here at y0. So the goal is to find the y1 that's over here associated with t1. But what I do is take the slope here and instead of going all the way across like I did with Euler's, I only go halfway across. So I'm going to go right here to t to the 1 half and I'll use that initial slope, whatever it is, and use it as a straight line to to propel the solution over here to this point, and that's the y to the one-half. 
So this is Euler's, but not taking it all the way across, just taking it half the way across. Now you've got it halfway across, you have a point, t to the one half, y to the one half, and right here you calculate the the um, derivative from the differential equation. You calculate it right at this point, okay? And you that's your second slope. Remember, the dy by dt is a slope. All right. So you put the t to one half, y to one half into the equation, and you calculate a second slope. So now I've got k1, which is the slope from the first point. I move over to this halfway point, and I calculate a k2. Okay, and I'm not done yet. I go back to my original. So here was my t naught. Here's t1. Here's t to the one half, and I'm sitting right here at point y zero. So t zero y zero is my um, initial point. I had that first slope, which was just a differential equation evaluated here, and that gave me the k one. I got over here to t to the one half, and I got k two, which should just mm, say it's a little flatter slope. Here's k two. Well, I take the value of k2, I transpose it back here. So let me try to change color, which I don't do very well. Oh, I'm black. Okay, blue. Okay, so here's this slope, but I use this k2, uh, bad drawing, k2 right here, and I use that to propel myself to a different halfway point. So I took this k2, transposed it back here to k0, which isn't physical, right? That's not physical. It's, it has not anything to do with the differential equation. But I took it and pulled it back here, and then I used it to propel myself to another halfway point. So this is again t to the one half, but this is another y zero. So this y to the one half, and this is a second one. I got a slope out of here. I call that one k three. And this is, of course, just an example of, you know, there's another step. It's fourth order, so we're going to do this again. We'll pull this k3 back over to here, but this time we're going to propel ourselves all the way over to t1 and see what we get. So here's the k3, and now I'm moving all the way across the interval to t1, and I'm using it to find a y1 on the other side, but based on the k3 from the halfway point, so I'm using all these different slopes to kind of propel myself across. I find a value over there, put it back in the differential equation, and get k4. And now you understand the why it's a fourth order. Okay? Now this is the end of the method. Finally, you're going to move all the way across from t0. You're going to go to t1. And you're starting at y0, and you're going to go to y1. But instead of using just one slope, like we did with Euler's, you use this combination of the slope, the k1 slope from Euler's, the k2, which was the first halfway point, k3, which was the ha second halfway point, and k4, which is the um, point all the way over at t1 that you got by using k3. And um, it works pretty well. So here's the Runge-Kuda method applied to the same problem as before. The step side was size was set at 1, the, and you can't tell any difference between this and the exact solution that we use for comparison. The only reason that you see these lines that look like straight lines here between it is because the only points that were computed was here, 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 because the step side was, was 1. So when there's just connecting the dots gave a straight line but you can see how the dots are right along the solution. Remember what you got with Euler's. Started here, it went way up somewhere up to here, came down, did like this, so it was completely erroneous. This was Euler's when h was 1. So you can see for the increase in complexity, you get a big savings as far as the time step um, that you can take. You can take a bigger time step and you get very good agreement. 
So those are the two methods. I hope that they are interesting to you and they propel you to look into more numerical methods. There's even books on them called numerical recipes on how to solve a lot of these equations. And when you use these numerical methods, you've got to look for stability. You have to look at how robust the method is, what kind of problems it can be applied to. Um, there's various ways to compute the errors. And then as you move up into your partial differential equations, you'll encounter the finite difference. And then the finite element method, which is widely spread in both mechanics and um, electrical problems.